On November 9th, 2010, God's Gift to the World was released. The greatest Call of Duty installment ever. Black Ops. I was in fourth grade, had recently turned 10, and was beginning to expand my video game horizons. I started off playing simple games on the Wii, as it was family friendly and was the appropriate console for young Timmy to be playing. But, like my older brother and all of his friends, and frankly mine too, I transitioned over to the Xbox 360 and began to try some first person shooters, of course, none being better than all reliable. The magnificent COD Black Ops. This was actually my very first Call of Duty. I was too busy grinding Super Mario Galaxy or melting in a rage fit playing Mario Party 8 at the time. I definitely didn't have the testicles to play such manly games until I eventually came around and was given the best first impression ever. Yes, I'm aware that this means I played World at War after the fact. I know, I'm impure just like most of you. The campaign was second to none, the multiplayer was great, but Zombies, a mere side mode, was the mode that consumed me entirely. I'm not gonna lie, I think it's the not shooting back part I enjoyed so much about Zombies at first. I sucked firm donkey dick at the multiplayer. Zombies was the shit though. You got space to move around and time to think, strategize for long-term survival, not just a brief gunfight. Beating my highest round gave me more satisfaction than getting any kill streak in multiplayer, and exploring each zombies map was far more compelling than the vicious spawn-die cycle of misery I was experiencing as a noob. Not gonna lie though, I do love the multiplayer. It's produced more fun for me than any other game. I just mostly played against bots though. World at War Zombies had laid out quite a sturdy foundation for the mode, and that's despite not having included one extra map that was initially going to be DLC 4. You see, only a few months had gone by since Jerez, and the next COD was already here, Modern Warfare 2, which predictably exploded with popularity and would surely overshadow one measly Zombies map. So Treyarch opted to wait and not release it yet. Rather, launch it with next year's game, Black Ops. So, with this abrupt change in plans, we had the privilege, the honor, of experiencing this new COD with Kino Der Toten, Theater of the Dead. You can tell this map should have been in World at War. It fits right in. The same four perks return, the same teleporters need to be linked to access Pack-a-Punch. The story continues as Richt often accidentally teleports the crew into the 60s, and it even has that same eerie horror vibe that World at War does. I remember my first time playing. I was scared shitless. The ambience is chilling. The uneasy silence is only interrupted by the screaming of the undead. The desolation of this once lively theater further strengthens the despair that engulfs you. These are all things that World of War maps mastered, each being horrifying in their own right. You're looking at a World of War map on an updated engine. Quick, think COD Zombies. Now, what's the first thing you envisioned? Chances are, you were thinking of Keynote or Toten, the most iconic Zombies map to date. Why is this? It's simple, really. It starts with Kino being a free on-disc map on what happens to be the highest-selling COD Zombies game. Right place, right time, I suppose. Obviously, though, if the map sucked, nobody would play it, so clearly this map did something right. Kino isn't a particularly challenging map. In fact, it's pretty easy, while also remaining fun. The fact that it was actually designed to be in a familiar, already successful World at War certainly also helped to make it a nice landing spot for players. None more than the casuals, though. Which was pretty much everybody at the time, not gonna lie. Point is, the map wasn't pushing players away like some in the past. It was gaining and retaining players like you wouldn't believe. It was the ultimate recipe for success, and soared to the top of everyone's favorite maps list. This also happens to be around the same time as the birth of Zombies content creation on the internet, specifically YouTube, which was sprouting some of the community's pioneers. I, for one, remember watching each and every segment of Syndicate's Upgrading Every Gun Challenge. Hey guys, it's Syndicate here, and today I'm bringing you a... All guns pack-a-punched in one game. We're gonna try and do this. We'll probably fail. <laughs> Miserably. The mode was now surging with popularity, as more and more people were spreading the word of how great this new shit is. Kino was so popular, it honestly became a bit overrated due to the volume of praise it got over the years. But make no mistake, Kino was an excellent start to what was simply the beginning. Kino shares much in common with all of the World at War maps, but none more than Doris, which directly parallels it both in terms of design and gameplay. What's this new Wonder Weapon? Fury. Similarly to the Wonder Waff, this brand new Thunder Gun serves infinite damage, in this case in the form of deathly compressed air. One shot of this thing will knock an entire wave of these guys on their asses. On any round, instantly, creating an elite method of what I like to call Get the fuck off of me. It's capable of killing more than the Wonderwaff and doesn't electrocute you, which 
I'd call a win-win. The only unfortunate thing about the Thunder Gun is the inability to obtain power-ups. You shouldn't expect any max ammos to come save your less than ideal ammo situation. That hardly matters though. Kino is very spacious. There's a variety of traps and plenty of viable training areas. So pick one and get to it. It's practically impossible to die with a Thunder Gun and practically impossible to not get it from the box eventually. As a new power up, allowing you to spin the box for a measly 10 points makes its debut too. You're usually able to crank out four spins each time, so the odds of you getting what you need are significantly higher now. Hounds return, but more noteworthy are the new Nova Crawlers, who on all fours are a lower enemy type to mix up the gameplay a little bit. I for one can't fucking stand them. They release their bowels all over the place when you kill them. It blinds you and reeks like hell, but nonetheless, they force you to attack both high and low. But other than these small tweaks, this gameplay is still giving off Darice vibes, right? Kino is easier than Darice though, at least for high rounds. There's more and better space to work with. The Thunder Gun is flat out better than the Wonderwaff, and if we're gonna be unfair, Black Ops just doesn't have the ample glitches and issues that World of War did, like an ineffective Juggernaut, or an ineffective Quick Revive for that matter, which now, in Black Ops, has a new ability. 500 points buys you an extra life on solo. Kino is largely considered a boring map due to its ease, but what cannot be ignored is how potent this map was right out of the bottle. This map hit instantly. With Kino shoving its way into the game and absorbing the majority of players, what truly is the real, authentic launch map for this game was largely ignored, completely overshadowed. This, ladies and gentlemen, is five, which is both the number of sides a Pentagon has and the approximate player count of this map at launch. <laughs> five is pretty much the complete opposite of Kino. Kino is easy and fun and casual, but five, nah. This map is difficult. It's not spacious with a good wonder weapon like Kino. Instead, we get narrow hallways again and one of the saddest excuses for a wonder weapon ever. The Winter's Howl. Or should I say, Deficient Ice Cube Blaster. Since these maps are so different, it generally forces players into one camp or the other. And believe me, all of the campers camped out in Kino like good Hitler youth boys they are, taking more and more attention away from the rightful king. Another reason for Five's unpopularity is simply the fact that it was locked behind the campaign thickening the barrier for casual player entry. Kino's available to everyone regardless of campaign completion, so it's played more, naturally. If you played the campaign, you surely recall the mission taking place at the Pentagon. You, Mason, meet with the president. They copied it from the campaign and pasted it into zombies. We should take Bikini Bottom and push it somewhere else! In this rendition, a meeting between these four prominent gentlemen in the 60s regarding the Cuban Missile Crisis occurs when Zombies suddenly break into the Pentagon. Seems a little far-fetched, right? Isn't it one of the highest security buildings in the world? Anyways, we get a break from the original four soldiers we're used to, as Prime Minister Fidel Castro, President Richard Nixon, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, and of course, President John F. Kennedy are all in the flesh, trying to keep their flesh from the zombies. I won't lie, it's a little trippy seeing all of these political historical figures shooting guns in a COD game. It's really cool, actually. The story is certainly far-fetched, but I think that's why it works. Creativity and doing the unexpected is what made zombies so compelling. Nobody panic, but there's an evil deranged scientist running around jacking everyone's shit. He's quick like a cheetah, and if he finds you, he's gonna touch you inappropriately. No Hopefully your secondary's any good, because now you've gotta track his ass down and take back what's yours. He's elusive, and you've gotta be quick, or he'll disappear like your dad on Christmas Eve when he went out to go get a pack of Newports. He's dead! The mean man's dead, and he left behind a max ammo and a fire sale. Rumor is, though, if you kill him before he touches you, he leaves an even more enticing will. This is the bonfire sale, which allows you to upgrade for only 1,000 points. Your best financial decision is to upgrade all of your guns if and when you get the bonfire sale. It's 80% off. Another power-up is out of the game as well, the Death Machine. It is a decent method for killing the Pentagon Thief. This guy is such a drastic change from Hellhounds, as the risk and reward are both increased. He adds a chaotic and fun dynamic to the game unlike any other boss, especially with a group of friends. My god goes around mugging people one by one until everyone's shit is gone. Everyone's screaming, running around like a rooster with a cock chopped off. 
You probably should panic, actually. Though 5 is clearly the less popular map, it serves an essential purpose, as it creates a fine duality amongst the launch maps. You've got the casual Kino juxtaposed with the Hardcore 5, offering players both types of experiences, so nobody feels alienated. If you just want to relax, play some Kino, and if you want to raise your blood pressure, play 5. These two complement each other very well, and together, make a great pair to start off with. Initially, I wasn't even going to talk about Dead Ops Arcade in this video, since it hardly feels attached to the standard first-person zombies mode we've come to know and love, but not at least mentioning it would be criminal. Dead Ops is a third-person arcade-style game, with a different set of rules. Forget everything you know for a second. You have an M60, by default. There is a myriad of power-ups to aid you along the way, including but not limited to guns, vehicles, etc, etc. Uh, you know, most notably though, loot. You're trying to get the most of it. The same core values of zombies are here, just in a very different way. It's competitive amongst players, so don't expect to be friendly with others. May the best man win. Or at least not get eaten by this giant gorilla. There are 40 total rounds, with a new stage every 3-4 to four rounds, of course increasing with difficulty each time. The story isn't entirely clear, and honestly, it doesn't really need to be. It shouldn't take itself too seriously, and it doesn't, as it's a harmless... Fun break from traditional zombies. Something to do when I'm bored of the norm. I also couldn't get over the soundtrack. I absolutely adore it. It's one of the leading incentives to play. If I had a nickel for every time I played Dead Ops, I'd probably have like a dollar or something. So not much. But there's plenty of fun to go around. Treyarch totally didn't have to make it, but I appreciate having it as a bonus. I can tell there was passion behind this project, and I respect it. You've just landed in a Soviet cosmodrome. Everything's black and white. A dull tone. You make your way over to the power, and the tone shifts. The mission is bigger than any other in the past. The objective is to free this dude named Dr. Gersh from the Casimir Mechanism, which is a whole lot of fucking confusing. But basically, you need to go around the map completing miscellaneous tasks in order to achieve the map's main story-driven goal. An Easter egg. The very first one at that. Completing an easter egg typically comes with a reward, in this case, a 90 second death machine. Which isn't really worth it, honestly, but the story was intriguing enough to motivate you to do it at the time. The story picks up where Kino left off, as the formidable four return. The story isn't too deep, but it was the first real attempt at interactive, in-game storytelling, so credit is given where it's due. Being the very first main easter egg already makes this map somewhat groundbreaking, and there's plenty more positive. Similarly to 5, you probably recognize this map from the campaign, in the iconic mission where you break into the Cosmodrome with Woods to save Weaver. It's home to the Ascension Group, who were basically the Russian version of Group 935. And whoop de fucking do another outbreak happens! Same shit, different part of the world! Nonetheless, these guys created some pretty cool stuff, including but not limited to the Thunder Gun, the new Gersh devices, Matryoshka dolls, and two brand new Perca Colas, PhD Flopper, the supremely popular soda which for 2,000 points negates all explosives, splash and fall damage, and has an additional ability of, well, this. That's just a good time. And Stamina Up Soda, a cool, refreshing lime beverage which also just happens to make your legs move much faster. These projects are few amongst many, however. These guys also happen to be working on space travel. No big deal. You think that's too much for them to handle? Well. Maybe, actually, since they somehow combined the two somewhere along the way. On one of their rocket tests, they added monkeys. Yeah, monkeys! Honest cargo with element 115, and the results were shocking! Yo, no ammo! These guys are little dickheads. They crash back down on Earth like they own the fucking place and run around stealing your perks. They appear as often as hellhounds, but definitely have a much bigger impact. 
as you're often compromising your perk selection. With teammates, you're able to cover more ground, but to comfortably maintain all four perks, you really need four coordinated players you trust. Otherwise, it's a total shit show. The Space Monkeys have been a major thorn in my ass for a decade. I will say though, they do provide a desperately needed challenge on an otherwise supremely easy map. Think about it. The Thunder Gun, more training space than ever before, including this giant dildo and spawn. It's a perfect recipe to coast right through the game with very little struggle. High rounds have never been more achievable. Well, other than Shino, but glitches hardly count. Linking the three Lunar Landers is a near identical means of unlocking Pack-a-Punch to that of the Teleporters, so clearly the gameplay doesn't make you uncomfortable. In fact, I'm not sure there are many more maps that make me more comfortable. I feel like I have a giant cushion under me to break any fall I might have. You'll notice from map to map there are typically shifts. Rarely are there two to three consecutive maps that are all very similar. They're usually broken up and diversified throughout. I suppose that's true here, since Ascension is clearly so much easier than the previous map, 5, but also strikes an uncanny resemblance to Kino in a multitude of ways. My take on Ascension is basically that of Kino, an all-time great, but not exactly adrenaline pumping. It's not a hot take, but Ascension keeps the ball rolling, and it's rolling faster and faster. Aside. It's been a straight road up to this point, but we make a sharp turn in July of 2012 with the release of Treyarch's most unique map thus far, Call of the Dead. Lights, camera, action! This is our director, the godfather of zombies himself, George Romero. You probably didn't watch it since it's old and boring in today's standards, but his most renowned work, Night of the Living Dead, established the foundation of the modern-day zombies genre responsible for inspiring this mode, so his presence here is actually a pretty big deal. On set are a collection of four remarkable actors, perfectly tailored to their role. Danny Trejo, most known for his machete action. Sarah Michelle Gellar, she was Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Daphne from the Scooby-Doo live-action films. Robert England, you might recognize him, he's just that Freddy Krueger guy. And to round it out, Michael Rooker, certified badass who I know from The Walking Dead and Guardians of the Galaxy. Wait, where on earth are we? Still Russia, Siberia to be exact, and it's just as cold and miserable as you might have imagined. We're here filming Call of the Dead, which is of course a metaphor for the gameplay. You're in the movie, you know? Except the set breaks down quickly as they all filmed at uh, an abandoned Group 935 research facility with a few remaining zombies there that were never taken care of. You know, George is kidnapped and turned, nothing big. It was a perfect movie idea. Too perfect. Snow, fog, and ice water all work against the player, making it much harder to navigate around the place. The atmosphere is a major change of pace, and so is the celebrity crew. I suppose the five characters are famous, but they're all dead and political, so it's less fun. Everything about this map is just different, and we're just getting started. <laughs> Call of the Dead's gameplay is also unlike any other. The first thing you'll notice is that big hunk George following you around which is new and terrifying. Granted, he shuffles at you at a dumb slow pace, but he follows you every second of the game. He has a tremendous presence, as he's the very first, what I like to call, tank boss zombie the mode has ever seen. His giant singular presence trumps that of the typical dog rounds we briefly fought throughout previous maps. He changes the dynamic of the game, as you have to constantly be on your feet, on high alert, to avoid him. If camping wasn't already a totally dead strategy at this point, this map was the final nail in the coffin, as staying put, simply isn't an option. When enraged, either by attacking you or vice versa, he throws a temper tantrum. Only to be cooled off in one of many pools of water throughout the map. Just describing him to you sounds like a lot, and that's without mentioning he has 250,000 HP per player. In other words, he's a strong boy. Thankfully, a brand new wonder weapon is injected into the game to put him down easier. An explosive sniper rifle at that. The Scavenger is a mighty fun gun to use, but does have its limitations. The explosive damage within short range is enough to put you six feet under, so PhD is pretty much a necessity while using it. And to be honest, it stops one-shotting zombies by around 40, which of course makes high rounds significantly harder than prior maps. Thankfully, Treyarch added another wonder weapon. Two! Super generous, right? That's until you find out the VR-11 is somehow even worse. It converts zombies into humans, and they kind of distract them. 
Problem is, there's very little ammo, and it can't kill more than the amount of ammo it has. So again, largely useless for high rounds, aside from its obscure co-op insta-kill ability. Two ineffective wonder weapons is better than one functional one, right? Regardless, it's the first map to have two wonder weapons added simultaneously, so I'd say that's unique. And I'd say their abilities are plenty unconventional to say the least. There also aren't any traps on this map, which is something I never hear anyone talk about. We've had traps on every map up to this point, aside from Noct, so a map totally devoid of them plays very differently. It's much harder to get by, it's why Call of the Dead high rounds practically don't even exist. There are some things to aid you along the way, a lot of which is derived from murdering George. If you kill him, which takes a lot, he leaves a random perk bottle and death machine behind, which is instead a wonder waff if you happen to have completed the easter egg already. It's temporary, but ironically, the only infinite damage wonder weapon this map has to offer, which is sort of cruel if you think about it. A new perk makes its debut, Deadshot Daiquiri, which for a low cost of 1500 points auto aims towards their heads along with increased hip fire accuracy. I mean, it's not going to change your inability to achieve 50 plus rounds, but it sort of helps, I guess. There's no reason not to get it though, since you can just get every single perk by killing George over and over again. The last noteworthy feature here is the very first moving pack-a-punch machine. There are like half a dozen locations around it for the map, usually spending five or so minutes at each location. Is this actually such a good thing, or is this just as much of an inconvenience as it appears at surface value? I'm never like, hey, Pap is moving to the complete opposite side of the map. I'm stoked. Regardless, it makes the game less predictable, which can be an exciting thing. Call of the Dead is easily my favorite map in this game, and is a top five of mine all time. What separates it from the crowd? Everything. Legit everything. There's so little about this map that's ever been replicated. From the characters, to the wonder weapons, to the atmosphere, this map did everything differently. Knowing I have to scratch and claw for every little thing, knowing there's a cap to the amount of success you can have, really pushes me to try my best on this map. In other words, on easy maps, I often let my guard down, or don't fully invest myself into it knowing my margin for error is large knowing if I make a mistake or two, it won't crush me. But Call of the Dead doesn't allow that. You've got to earn every bit of this map. It's cold. Full pun intended. The Wonder Weapons may leave a lot to be desired, but the sheer quantity and versatility of them somewhat compensates. And I, personally, can better deal with shitty circumstances when I'm on this many drugs. George is annoying, but he does compensate you greatly in death and is endearing as all hell. It's not for everyone. No map is. But as far as I'm concerned, Call of the Dead is a one-of-a-kind, must-play experience that I think was much more valuable than people will acknowledge. Excuse me, is there anyone out there that would be willing to help? Hello? Rick Toffin accidentally teleported the crew way too far into the future and find themselves here, in a dark bunker, in the middle of a Siberian winter, in the year 2012. The actors just so happened to be around filming, and thus were able to help them teleport back into the past. Not before having them also retrieve a key component to a device Rick Toffin needs to fulfill his plan of literally taking over the world. His intentions up to this point have been unclear to us and his blissfully ignorant crew, but his ultimate plan includes, first, making a few stops to grab a few necessary artifacts. This stop is for a golden rod. And with that, we out. Welcome to Shangri-La, which, synonymous with paradise, is an exotic jungle temple tucked away in the Himalayas. A lost shrine is contained within, amongst treacherous underground caverns, deadly traps, and the undead. Lush, vibrant wilderness, as far as the eye can see, establishes such a beautiful tone for this map right away, but like strippers and gambling, is a bit ugly on the inside. Shangri-La was viciously hated by the community in its first days, and despite it aging well over the years as people got more comfortable with it, the hate is totally justified. The gameplay for this map is much uglier than the atmosphere would imply. The layout is tight, the most condensed it's been for a while now. 5 was the last map to really push the player to the limit the way this map does. Except 5 at least has some space to work with on solo. Shangri-La really doesn't. The best strategy is to simply never stop moving, to not really settle for any particular space. I can think of one or two half-decent spots, but there really isn't a comfortable place to be, which is just the beginning of it. Like Call of the Dead, there are also no traps for the player to use, only ones working against you, including spikes, rushing water, and mud that practically brings you to a complete stop. I haven't even mentioned the fact that pack-a-punching requires all players in the game to simultaneously stand on stones scattered throughout the map, which proves nearly impossible in the case of playing with no micers, let alone the conglomerate of aids this map likes to label as boss zombies. Monkeys are back, but not in the way they were on Ascension. Rather, in a significantly worse fashion, as they run around stealing power-ups. They can be manipulated to benefit you, as you can convert whatever power-up you may have not wanted into something you need. 
but they interfere so frequently, it simply becomes annoying after a while. Thing 1, the Shrieker, Shrieker sprints a 4-3 and blinds you into oblivion. While Thing 2, the Napalm Zombie, oppositely shuffles around and sets shit ablaze. The monkeys are a lot to deal with as is, and so these guys being thrown into the mix feels like too much. While they keep you on your feet, they collectively make an already very tough map much tougher. It's a lot to keep track of, right? It's bullshit! I hate this map! This is the 3179JGB215, aka the Baby Maker. Each shot shrinks every zombie in its path into a little baby, which you can then punt to finish off, because although this weapon sets you up for success, it technically does zero damage, as they grow back quickly. Assuming you're using it correctly, however, this gun is amongst the best ever. Its potential kill count is enormous due to its range and high ammo count. Like seemingly everything on this map, this gun can be dangerous since you must run into the horde to finish off the kills, which puts you in harm's way. But again, these are only problems for people who make them problems. Its upside is extremely high, and is one of the only bright spots of the gameplay. Let me just add, by the way, this gun is so fucking cool. It's just so unique, and I'm talking Treyarch might have inhaled paint thinner while brainstorming it unique. The heat and humidity is just excruciating. According to the locals, the temple should be in this mountain range just up this river. Gary, do you hear that? A waterfall! We must be close. Hand me the binoculars. There is a structure up ahead. If this is truly a gateway to Argatha, my work will finally be validated. Uh, Brock, I don't think this place is abandoned. Don't be silly. This place has to be thousands of years old. Shangri-La's Easter Egg is less of a fetch quest and more of a genuinely interactive story, which starts with two explorers by the name of Brock and Gary stumbling into the temple in search of Agartha, which goes by many names. It can best be described as a dimension outside of ours. Whatever. Their joyous endeavor quickly gets turned upside down, however, as they inevitably get lost within the temple, with an unexpected horde of zombies waiting outside. Panic washes over the two as they scramble to escape with their lives. What the hell was that? Why is the sky dark? It's an eclipse! We must have... Run! What are those things? Zombies! We have to find another way! Zombies? What are you talking about? The writings must have been right. The... No! Don't touch that! Damn! Take a look around and try to find a way out. I got nothing. We will have to conserve our supplies. Take your shoes off and hand me your socks. They meet their demise. Until, of course, Rick Toffin and the gang pull up and search for another component for his device, the Focusing Stone. By entering the Eclipse, time is reversed back to Brock and Gary still being alive, as each step in the Easter Egg is a means of preventing their imminent death. Through trial and error, they're able to escape, and reward Rick Toffin with the Focusing Stone for doing so. It's one of the most immersive Easter Eggs, as the storytelling is perfectly infused with the steps. With the stone now in his possession, Rick Toffin fuses it with the rod from Call of the Dead and completes the device he needs. Time to finish the plan. Shangri-La has a lot of bad, but some good too. The gameplay puts you in a chokehold and never lets go, but the atmosphere and storytelling alone is almost enough to make up for it. Unfortunately, when it debuted, a lot of the good wasn't unearthed yet. Just the remarkably difficult gameplay on the surface, which is why it developed such a bad reputation that still lingers to this day. I wouldn't put it at the top of my favorite maps list, and honestly, it's one of the weaker maps in the game, but I don't think that says much given how strong every map is. Black Ops Zombies had been an absolute sensation up to this point, and so a grand conclusion was a must. DLC 4, which was actually originally planned to be in Paris, takes us to, wait for it, the moon. We've come a long way, haven't we? It seemed a little hard to believe, even while in-game. Like, we started out in a small, primitive bunker, but here we are, killing zombies in space. This DLC gets its name, Resurrection, by also remastering the four World of War maps and adding them alongside Moon for no additional charge, which was a pretty baller move considering they could have not even thought about it, but I suppose this is a time long before Activision started milking the udders dry of each of their games. Given five maps is greater than one, I would say this DLC far and away gives you the most bang for your buck. It's the obvious purchase if you can only afford one, which undoubtedly boosted Moon's popularity to some extent. The first few moments are confusing, given the map is called Moon and we're very clearly not on the Moon. It's Area 51 to be exact. 
which makes a little bit of sense given the space connection. What's also unusual is that Packet Punch and some perks are already here, which is a sudden change from having to progress through the game and find them. You may think you have time to spend here and obtain such valuables, but unfortunately you really only have like 30 seconds until they start sprinting and hounds show up, which makes earning the necessary points much tougher, especially with the starting pistol. So unless you're a ballsy son of a bitch, you're gonna walk right over to that inconspicuous teleporter and leave. Finally, we're on the mood. I'm suffocating. Time to put on this mask. Teammate? Nope. Just some random douche astronaut who walks around the place waiting for just the right moment to grab you and violate you. The anti-gravity is taking some getting used to. After all, we've never been in space before, so this is pretty new. It can help you potentially move quicker around the map, but if you're not careful, it might just fling you right into the wrong place. You'll probably have noticed so far that although Moon has some good qualities, it seems to have just as many bad qualities to counteract them. And this trend continues. The spacing is great, but there's almost too much of it. The map is enormous. Getting from one side to the other is lengthy. For example, if your friend dies in the biodome while you're in spawn, you can basically just kiss them goodbye. You arriving there on time is impossible. The giant excavators that come crashing down every few rounds decompress crucial areas of the map, forcing you to wear a mask in said areas for the remainder of the game even after turning on power. Good and bad, everywhere you look. No wonder this map's reputation is totally split. This is the hacker device, which allows you to manipulate the game in ways you never thought possible. You ever think to yourself, Hey, I wish these doors were cheaper. Hacker. I wish I could return this perk I no longer want. Hacker. Or hey, can I get a free box spin? Why yes. Yes you can. Hacker. Hack your guns, perks, doors, power-ups, hell, even your teammates. The uses for this hacker are seemingly limitless, giving you far more opportunities and flexibility than any other map. It's essentially a mod, but in a far more ethical manner which I can totally get behind. Moon also has some really cool wonder weapons, most notably the brand new Zap Guns. I hope this doesn't affect my fragility. Zap, zap, zap! <laughs> Pretty cool, huh? Well, there's actually a lot more than what meets the eye. When morphed together, you can create an even cooler gun. You dare touch me, minion? The Wave Gun is great for killing large hordes, while the Zap Guns are better for close range, singular combat. They're individually great and collectively unstoppable, but like all good things on this map, there is a drawback. No max ammo. It's a lot like the Thunder Gun in that way, except even when disregarding the Zap Guns, the Wave Gun alone has just as much ammo, making it the superior wonder weapon. Despite everyone thinking the Thunder Gun is better, the returning Gersh devices pair alongside the new QED, or Quantum Entanglement Device, which excitingly gives you a completely random anything. Could be a gun, power-up, who knows. Needless to say, the wonder weapon variety here isn't too shabby. In fact, I'd say underrated. Good thing, too, since Mule Kick made its debut here. A perk allowing you to carry a third gun. Four grand! It is helpful, but is quite a large investment, so nobody would blame you if you just totally forgot it existed and walked away. That would be pretty hard, though, given they added it in every previous map in this game, even the World of War ones. If you started playing Zombies at Moon or Beyond, you probably didn't even know that they were added in hindsight, which is unfortunately a false reality I lived under for a while myself. I still don't know how I feel about Moon to this day. Part of me really enjoys the cool wonder weapon and perk variety, the hacker, and biodome vibes. But part of me is truly irritated with this map. You know what's annoying? No oxygen, having to go back and forth to Earth constantly since Jug and Speed alternate each visit, teleporting Novas, a lot of it sucks. High rounds aren't the worst, but with no traps and no wave gun max ammo complicates things. I can't be the only one who feels so divided on Moon. My opinion of it varies depending on the given day. Remember when Rick Toffin teleported Maxis and his daughter Samantha away? It was to push them out of the picture so that nobody could get in the way of his grand scheme. Maxis was right to be suspicious of Rick Toffin's frequent absence, because he was actually here, on the moon, constructing Griffin Station with the help of a few other defective scientists. Sorry, but how does Maxis not pick up on this sooner? He builds this whole fucking facility and a giant soul-absorbing pyramid too. Even more interestingly, Samantha was actually teleported here of all places after her final moments at the Duris facility. While open, she entered the MPD and became trapped, only to be freed by Rick Toffin, whose true intention is to swap souls with her and control the ether. And subsequently, the zombies, as she has throughout the entire game. This is the Easter egg, and one of the best ever at that. Don't get me wrong, it has its fair share of RNG. You need specific guns from the box and one particular excavator to make things work, but the storytelling is second to none. The build up to this point was intense, and the payoff followed suit as Richtofen swapped souls 
with Samantha, blows up the Earth, and takes complete control of what's left of the world. What a weekend. Players are rewarded all perks sustained even when downing, a 90 second death machine, and some cool gamer picks and some of the heftiest achievements Xbox had to offer, which is a tremendous sum of tangible rewards on top of the feeling of massive accomplishment. Earth looks much different after the explosion, along with the new blue zombie eyes, both foreshadowing what was to come next. But for now, we close out Black Ops Zombies with a figurative and literal bang. Each game in the series has its own unique makeup, its own style that comes with its own advantages and disadvantages. For example, World at War is bare bones, which, despite its endearment, comes with issues. A more recent game like Black Ops 4, though, for example, may go too far in the opposite direction, over-refining the game to a lifeless mediocrity. When we have the go conversation, these things come up, and the ugly gets exposed. But honestly, I really haven't found many true blemishes in the original Black Ops Zombies. Sure, maybe it doesn't have the overall resume of Black Ops 3, the highest peaks of Black Ops 2, but it's very close, and it also doesn't have as many glaring weaknesses as those games. If I had to use one word to describe this game, I wouldn't use best, because there's an argument to be made for multiple games taking the crown. Rather, strong. It's a strong overall mode. It's unapologetically and consistently itself. There isn't one defining glitch, issue, or exploitable variable. Instead, rock-solid gameplay. New and great weapons, perks, and other mechanics, and an increasingly deep and intriguing story reaches a cliffhanging peak with a multitude of new, likable characters along the way. It maintains a consistent theme, yet each map feels different from the last, offering an experience for everybody. Be it casual and fun like Kino and Ascension, or tough like Five and Shang. This game, while maybe not necessarily the undisputed best, is certainly a top of the list, as it seems to have just about everything you could ask for, in a time that wasn't too primitive, but nowhere close to the eventual dump this mode would become. We can debate which is the best, but what's inarguable is the greatness of Black Ops Zombies.